Welcome to the Musicians Creating Prosperity Online Summit. I'm Fabiana Clore, pianist and business coach for musicians, and I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker for today's event. Nick Finzer is joining us. He is a wonderful trombonist, entrepreneur, producer, composer, and educator. And we will have a wonderful conversation with him today that I hope is going to enlighten all of you. Thank you, Nick, for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Fabiana, for having me. Appreciate it. I'm also pleased to call Nick a colleague at uh, the University of North Texas, where we both uh, work. And it's been great uh, getting to meet him in person and to introduce him to the students that I also mentor in the Music Business and Entrepreneurship Program at UNT and to meet his students uh, who work with him uh, in my classes. So I've been following Nick throughout the years, and I, now I get to see his work a little bit closer. So it's been great to connect with him. Thank you, Nick, for being here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And it's been really great to hear about what you've been doing. You know, when I'm talking to my students and I'm like, oh, so what's going on? And they're like, oh, in the music entrepreneurship class, we're talking about this and this, and we're talking about their ideas. And so uh, even if I'm not officially in the class, I feel like uh, I've gotten I've gotten a good idea of what's happening. And we've talked about it with my students. And so I'm glad to call you a colleague as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. And, you know, one of the most important things we can have as educators is the role model factor, right? And to be able to inspire our students through what we do in addition to what we teach, right? And I know your students, when they come to my class, they just rave about you, you know, when they're thinking about innovative models and innovative musicians and, you know, just role models. I ask them to bring in, you know, some examples of their favorite musicians out there. And they always come with like, my teacher is the first one, you know, so I think that's so special. Well, that's nice of them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. When they bring in, for example, websites that they want to emulate and like, let's choose this, let's choose that. They always come and, you know, they start with your thing. So that's a wonderful way to impact them in addition to the actual teaching. So well, thank you good. for that. Yeah, of course. I'm glad that it's, I'm glad it's uh, through osmosis they're getting something uh, from me from that side. Absolutely. So today we're going to really dive into what it takes for musicians to create prosperity, right? And how can we adapt in this interesting, you know, challenging time we're living? Uh, and so perhaps maybe we could start with a little bit of your background, Nick, and, you know, how you developed your entrepreneurial spirit, like how you became entrepreneurial in the process of being a trombonist, a producer, a composer, entrepreneur, educator, all those things, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah, no, I don't mind. Uh, I was thinking about this actually this last week, getting, you know, thinking, talking with my family and kind of reflecting on some um, growing up. And it's always been a part of me to be kind of not sitting still and not waiting around for things to happen uh, to me, basically, but always trying to think about where I want to be going and where I'm, what, what I want to be doing. And um, I guess what I realized was that I kind of had role models from my parents growing up that it was just normal, basically, and even my grandparents, too. Like, it was just normal that you would be doing some stuff like on your own, that you would be taking advantage of whatever opportunities were coming your way, you'd be taking advantage of the fact that you can work for yourself. And, you know, when I was growing up, my dad, he worked in the sign industry, like making big signs for stadiums and casinos and things like that. And and so he had a company and my mom had her own company doing uh, per, per, getting permits for construction and permits for this and that. And so it was always normal that they were just doing their own thing all the time. And I didn't think too much of it. And my aunt had her own embroidery business. And uh, my grandfather was a a neon sign maker also he would bend the neon signs in his basement so when we would go over to his house like we would go down in the basement and watch him heat up the glass and you know make all these signs and it was just a normal part of life you know that and i never thought about it really before uh recently and that it's just it's kind of been one of those things so uh i've always had projects going and since i was in high school basically having bands and made my first album way back then, kind of like in senior year of high school, first year of college, and just kind of never looked back. And I didn't have any money, but I knew that I could have the time and energy to put in and learn in the skills that have eventually now turned into 
a record label and, and media company that I run called Outside of Music, where I, it's basically all the stuff I learned from 2005 to 2020 uh, kind of were able to, you know, help other musicians kind of skip all the all the dirty work and kind of get them get them going in the right direction, creating prosperity for themselves and creating their art as a business and not just thinking about it as I'm going to make this art and I and I hope someone buys it, you know, and as you know, and so uh, for me, it's, it's just always been a part of who I am following those role models like we were started talking about and um, just never lurking, looking back. Um, and I just I guess it's something that I'm interested in, you know, when I have time and watch YouTube, like I'm maybe watching business videos and marketing videos and this kind of thing, in addition to watching plenty of jazz videos and trombone <laughs> videos. But uh, it's it's just, that's that's kind of how it came to be, I think, just through osmosis. And because I, when I think about it, I'm always thinking of ideas. I'm, I'm never sitting around. Even when I started at UNT, the first thing I said is we gotta have a jazz trombone day. We just did it two weeks ago for the second year in a row. And we had over almost 2000 people at an online event. And like, I just, I can't not be doing something and not be working on some kind of, at least for me, big project. And uh, so I just, I, if it propels me forward to have goals and deadlines. And so I've just kept it as a, a part of me and it doesn't bite me in the butt too often. Every once <laughs> in a while, for sure. But um, so that that's kind of how I got started with it and just, learning through doing, you know, I love it. I love it. And you know what, that's so interesting that you share that because I think, you know, it can eventually become so ingrained in your subconscious that you're not even aware of it. And I remember right. when I first started learning about entrepreneurship formally, when I was doing my doctoral studies it was in piano performance, but I started learning about these courses in music business and entrepreneurship. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm going to learn about this. I have no idea. But the more I learned about it, the more I realized that I had been doing a lot of those things just naturally. Like we're not really programmed to decide, OK, I'm going to become entrepreneurial at this point. But we just right. start doing it. And then we go back and we're like, oh, yeah, that was very entrepreneurial, you know. So I can totally see. How, and especially if you grow up in an environment where you see that in your parents and your family, you yeah. know, and that, that's so wonderful. And it actually inspires me to want to model that for my kids, too, you know, and help them. Mm -hmm just grow up one day and be able to say, oh, you know, my parents were just very entrepreneurial, you know, so yeah. I'm listening to you speaking. I'm like, oh, I want my son to talk about me one day that way <laughs> too, you know? Um, and, and when, you know, when I joined UNT five years ago, I had that same like inkling of like, I'm going to build a program and I want to create a music entrepreneurship competition. So, you know, it's been for the last four years, just every year we've been having all these events. And so I hear you, this desire to constantly be putting things in motion, right? whether you are doing them 100% on your own or you're part of an institution, like it's this just spirit of putting things in motion and making them work. And then they can go on. Like it doesn't mean they always need you, but it's just kind of setting things in motion and kind of birthing projects basically, you know? So right. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Could you um, share a little bit more about your outside in music company and you know your other ventures like the nonprofit and your online teaching? And specifically, you know, what are some of the key entrepreneurial principles that you have learned in pursuing all of these amazing initiatives? Yeah, so um, I guess the, the thing to take away from book, talking about both of those things that I'll talk about the story of both of them, but it's, it's just exactly what we were just saying is that you have to learn by doing and that doing is more important than thinking about it. You can come up with a million great ideas, but until you start to execute on them, uh, they don't really mean anything, at least from my perspective. And action creates momentum, and that momentum is what kind of leads things forward. And um, and knowing that you don't know, even though like we kind of chart a course for ourselves, or maybe set goals and all these important things, you kind of have to know that there's going to be some magic involved, you know, mm -hmm. somewhere down the yeah. line, you know. And one thing will lead to another. Like for example, a a radio promotion of my one of my albums was what got me. Uh, known to the UNT jazz faculty and got invited to be a guest artist and then to apply for the job and eventually work there at the school. So it's like something totally unrelated, releasing an album and like doing a radio promotion campaign suddenly leads to something else. So don't be afraid of like allowing the space for that magic. But uh, to actually answer your question specifically, uh, Outside in Music was birthed basically out of necessity. Um, my very first record when I finished college at Juilliard, or grad school rather, um, I decided what better way to continue going into debt but 
make a rep, make a CD. And uh, so between the last day of class and the graduation, there was like a week of time that usually, I don't know, maybe you're preparing to be into the real world, celebrating that you're finished. But I was like, no, we're going into the studio. And we're going to make a record. So we did that. And I, always, I just I remember it just because that's a very you know pivotal time after finishing grad school, but made that record. And when I went to go try to put it out, um, I realized that my timeline was not the timeline of any of the labels that I talked to and nobody knew who I was. And I was just in been in New York for two years and and I had no reputation yet or anything. And so I just was like, oh, I'm going to figure out how to do this on my own. I've released albums before. Uh, with band projects I've been a part of it, part of this is a great way for me to learn how to do this and I'm just going to do it myself. So I did it not thinking it was going to be much of anything. I thought I was going to do my first album and that's going to be it. <laughs> I'll do it and then I'll release stuff on other labels after that. And so I did that. Uh, two years later in 2015 I put out another album and I worked with another label um, and the experience ended up being slightly frustrating to not have control of everything, number one, and to not be able to um, choose all of the different aspects that I wanted to be. And it ended up being more expensive also. So a uh, multiplicity of factors led me to just say, you know what, I think I can actually do this myself better uh, or just as well. I don't know about better, but just as well as anyone else is doing it uh, on this level of kind of indie, not like Sony, you know, right. Blue Note, not the top level. And so just by doing that and then noticing that my peers were having the same struggles as I was having and they would call me and ask me questions. And what I discovered was that it was easier for me to just do it for them than it was to try to explain all of the concepts, all of the reasoning. And so I just kind of said, hey, just let me do it. I'll put it out. I have this little imprint, you know, I started it. Let's just do it like this. And so a few friends put out records and we kind of built from there. And then the last couple of years, we've been doing 30 to 40 releases a year. And in order to, in my mind, differentiate ourselves from every other label, I've just always been at the forefront of thinking about, okay, everything we do has to be focused on a 360 picture, not just the album, because the album is just the starting point and using it to build content around artists, including videos and podcasts and summits and the, all of the various things that we do in the 21st century media landscape and particularly in every other field other than jazz and music in general um, does, does all these online events and does these kind of summits and interviews and thinks about content and everything. Um, so trying to get our artists to get on board with that stuff too, which can be a little bit of a challenge. But um, So that's why I call it a record label and a media company because for me it's you can't just put out an album. You have to do more than that. And um, so that's why I started it, because I thought I could do it just as well. And then it kind of ended up helping some of my friends along the way. And now, you know, we're doing 30 to 40 releases um, each year. And so it's just kind of grown organically. And now we have three, three different imprints that we release under helping younger artists that's called next level and then we have our outside in music label and we do we've been delving into a new genre that i learned about this year called it's like chill lo-fi like there's a lot of videos on youtube you can find that say like music for studying chill hop whatever and it's all like instrumental and kind of a lot of them use jazz samples so we've started collaborating with djs and um with our artists and kind of making music that's really not what i necessarily thought i'd be making but um, actually, a former UNT student uh, is one of the DJs we've been collaborating with. So it's been a nice way to kind of in include everyone in there uh, on that side. So that's why I started that. And um, the nonprofit, sorry, I'm speaking for a long time, but oh, you're great. I'm just going to keep going. The, the nonprofit is called the Institute for Creative Music. And we started the Institute for Creative Music back in 2010, no, 2011 was when we actually incorporated it. Um, and that was out of the necessity. Uh, with a bunch of friends from undergrad from Eastman. I went to the Eastman School of Music and grew up in Rochester there. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to tour with our band. We had a we had a fusion kind of funk fusion band that we wanted to tour with. And we didn't, every gig that we would get would be like 200 bucks, 300 bucks, the door. I'm like, how are we going to fly out to the West Coast? Because my parents had moved out to the West Coast. So we were like, okay, well, maybe if we fly out there, we can stay with them and play some gigs. So in order to figure that out, we said, okay, we need to develop an educational curriculum based around the music that we have. And so once we did that, we realized we kind of had a system of 
teaching improvisation without music to students who um, otherwise had not experienced that before. So we would go into like elementary school bands and orchestras and choirs and just do an improvisation workshop um, using 21st century kind of uh, pointillistic techniques or just kind of sound techniques and textures to get them improvising, whether they were jazz musicians or classical musicians or whatever. So we kind of built a whole curriculum around that. We're like, you know what? We could actually apply for grants if we had a nonprofit. So then I was like, all right, let me buy a book about starting a nonprofit. So me and a friend uh, of mine read this book about forming a nonprofit and we did that. And uh, everything from there has been kind of focused around that idea, using improvisation as a vehicle for improving musicianship, regardless of level and regardless of experience with improvisation. So not so much focusing on the kind of traditional jazz uh, repertoire all, all the time, really just focusing on the concept of improvisation in general. So it's been really, really rewarding to be able to go into and see like students that can only play three notes, but can com compose like a kind of um, uh, Steve Reich-esque kind of piece, like on the spot, and it gets them excited, you know, and so that's kind of where, where the joy that we got out of that. And so we did that for a long time in Rochester when we were doing that, we've done it in New York, and then we had a connection with a school in Montana, and we ended up going to Montana three or four times and going out to places that had never really had any guest artists come to their schools. And we were able to get grants to do that. And so that was all, again, the same principle of like, all right, I'm going to jump in head first. And I'm going to figure it out because uh, this is what needs to happen. So um, so that's the Institute for Creative Music. We started doing that. And now we've transitioned that over the last three to four years to be uh, online. And we've created some courses for beginning improvisers using that kind of model where we're not we're not learning all the jazz tunes yet. We're like starting out with just improvisational concepts that will get you maybe into jazz if you want to get into jazz later. But um, but yeah, so again, it's, it's that that's the concept, like jump in head first and figure it out, because if you got to learn through doing, I can read a bunch of books, but until I had to call the IRS and figure out how to get that tax ID number, uh, you know, I couldn't I didn't know really what I was supposed to do. So uh, just learning through doing. I love me. that. Thank you so much. Wow. What a wonderful journey. Wow. It's just incredible. There's so many golden nuggets of wisdom in what you just shared. And I just want to tie into like this improvisational, you know, pedagogy and all this idea of teaching musicians to improvise whatever level of ability they have and whether it's jazz or just the art of improvisation is such a beautiful thing that can be so easily transferred into the notion of being an entrepreneur because like we have to improvise all the time right this is kind of how things go as you say we just experiment and then we adapt and we go back and we improve and then we just try some other, other things out and you know in the in the classical um in the classical training you know it's not something that is really touched touched upon as much as in jazz studies and in jazz training popular music and so i i'm just so inspired by hearing how you infused all these different communities and different populations with the art of improvisation and i'm not surprised that it became one of your ma mantras right because that's what you it's in your nature from being very entrepreneurial and wanting to help others step outside of their comfort zone and especially as a classically trained musician you know i took three semesters of jazz piano when i was doing my doctor degree because mm -hmm. i love jazz but it was one of the hardest courses that i took in the entire degree program you know it was sure. just it was one on one. And, and I remember just experiencing such frustration sitting in the practice room, having my jazz homework and having to learn how to improvise on all these very simple tunes. I could play the Rahman in a first piano concerto, but I couldn't <laughs> improvise on happy birthday, you know, yeah, right, and right. I was just like, how is this possible? It's like, you know, it was, it was very frustrating. And, uh, you know, it's so I can see how impactful if if you're able to expose younger students at an early age to this just this habit of improvising and it doesn't mean they need to become jazz musicians but it's just building that into their brain it's just such a wonderful thing that you're able to do and help them expand what is possible so thank you for sharing that and i you know your online teaching has also flourished and you've developed a very very strong presence online and so thank you for sharing you know kind of what what are the key things that you've used in in building all these different uh, enterprises sure so I've got another question for you, okay. uh, which is, you know, things have changed so much in the last year, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, 
in your in your particular situation how has your life been affected by the pandemic like what has changed and specifically how has being a musician entrepreneur really impacted your ability to adapt well uh, I mean, I think the biggest change is just losing out on a lot of the opportunities that I was looking forward to for the year, you know, I think. And that's the same for hundreds, thousands of others. So um, I won't bemoan my own personal uh, gigs that didn't happen because hopefully they will um, get rescheduled. But um, I for me, for me, I have embraced the digital first thing for so long. Uh, 15, 2015, 2016 was when I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. Uh, it's really an important part of what we do as musicians. And I, I kind of see now everybody catching up to what things that I've been doing for five, six years already. And so on, on the one hand, I'm kind of sometimes I'm like, oh, don't do it that way. Oh, oh. <laughs> like you're going to nobody's going to you know click on that or nobody's going to swipe up on your Instagram thing. So I've resisted and I'll let everybody gets can needs to learn on their own uh, process. But um, I've been running a virtual online teaching studio since 2015 or 2016 and doing Skype lessons. And so when they're like, oh, we're going to go to Zoom, I literally didn't have to do anything because everything was already set up for me to teach. I've always been teaching lessons so for, online. So for me, it was watching everybody else kind of catch up and see that like, I can see you can see the light bulb going off of how much there was a reliance, especially amongst my, you know, colleague group, and not only at UNT but kind of like in New York, other musicians my age that are in jazz world, kind of seeing like, oh crap, like I've been relying so long on the week to week, the gig to gig, uh, thing that now I need to plan. Now I need to figure out how to make money. Now I need to figure out how to pay the rent after the pandemic, unemployment insurance runs out and. Uh, it's been great to see a lot of them that have done nothing for so long pick, picking up on it. And to me, it's like really inspiring to be like, yes, finally, like that person is like doing something <laughs> like I'm really happy for them and seeing them do, have success. And I'm just like, I wish people would have known that all along they could have done it, done these things. And they did they have the skills and that it was an important part of what we do. Uh, so for life, for me in the in this pandemic has been how can I, you know, upgrade what I've been doing or like how can I double down on the content and so like I challenged myself in different ways and so over the summer I decided in July since we weren't teaching at school had the summer off I was like all right can I make I was going to do Christmas in July for jazz trombone uh, educational videos and I was like all right can I do 25 videos in 30 days and um, it was really busy but I managed to do it so I did 25 unique educational videos and um it really just kind of put the pedal to the metal for me, this whole situation in terms of like making more content, making more books, doing more courses. I've got all the kind of like more stuff in the in the uh, can, as I guess you'd say, than I can release because I'll just overwhelm uh, my audience for sure. But um, it's just been going as hard as I can. I mean, I'm kind of a person when I see everybody else is like, I don't know what to do. I'm going to go hard because I'm like, I'm going to try to like use this everyone else being slow as kind of a momentum to kind of catch up or get out ahead of, uh, of um, other people that want to do the same thing. Because I really I saw when everything was going up, like, OK, there's going to be more people doing jazz trombone lessons, you know, and right. I've been doing it, but that doesn't mean somebody else isn't going to do it better or do more different. So I was like, I need to kind of double down on my strategy and look back at what I've been doing and say, is what I'm doing really effective and um, so I've, you know, I've tried to change and I've been using this year to kind of test out some ideas and started doing a little more live streaming and doing different kinds of content that I've done before over the last year and just to kind of try to connect with the audience in different ways. And we did like a jazz trombone boot camp, you know, over the summer as well, just trying to try things. So like I said, like for me, it's like, all right, let's try this, see if it works. Let's try this, see if it works. Let's try it and see if it works. And a lot of it doesn't, but uh, some of it does. And so it's been a chance for me to kind of test those ideas and um, kind of watch and see how things unfold. So. I mean, I'm hopeful that things will develop, but I think that all of this online teaching stuff in particular is going to stick. You know, people from all over want to connect with other musicians and for you to be able to have the ability to connect with them uh, 
from anywhere in the world, which has been available, but now just people realize that it's available, uh, is really good to see. And so I'm really happy to see, you know, my friends and colleagues from New York, like doing doing well and really taking advantage of that. Um, but yeah, for me, that's kind of been what it is. Pedal to the metal, double down and kind of see how much I can do, which is maybe not the healthiest or balanced, most balanced approach, but it's kind of just my natural state to say like, all right, let's go, <laughs> you know? Right. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing that. And what comes, what I'm listening to is like this innate ability to adapt that comes sure. across from you, you know, and, and you are able to just look at your environment, find the opportunities and adapt into creating solutions for those problems that you see and adapt into presenting offers and services and things and content. And, and you did it before. And so it sounds like when the pandemic hit and you saw this new wave of like all this online education and, you know, all these things, you continuously, you just continue transferring those adaptability skills that you have been practicing before and now just take things to a whole new level when you see the new waves. And, you know, a year from now, things may be even different. So it sounds like this ability to adapt quickly and to find opportunities and to find problems to solve has helped you in all these different moments of your life including now when the pandemic hit and you know you're seeing now okay all of a sudden i'm not the only jazz trombone educator anymore right. there's yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. online educator there's like all these you know so how can i continue leading the leading the movement basically you know and so that's that's so inspiring because i think it's not you know even though we know that necessity is the mother of innovation right like you said i built outside of music because i had to you know it was something that i needed to do i started my music academy when i started my business right after you know as I finished my doctoral degree, we started our music school because, you know, my husband and I were two, you know, doctorals in piano performance and who knew, you know, where we would end up. And we just decided to make our own business and started that way. And we ended up hiring our friends, you know, and it's just mm -hmm. like, you do things cause you have to. Right. Um, and so now it's the same thing. And I think in terms of like golden nugget from this is like, yes, how quickly can you adapt and not necessarily spend too much time analyzing what you should or shouldn't do, but just be willing to experiment and just try things out and say, let me just figure this out. As you said, let me give it a try and maybe it works. And if it doesn't, I'll go quickly and try something else. So that's, right. that's so powerful. I mean, it, you're just showing that in all your stories here. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so I've got a, another, another question that is more along the lines of, you know, for many musicians, they're in survival mode right now, right? They're just mm -hmm. trying to make ends meet. They're trying to be able to provide for their families, be able to just survive all the challenges that we have. And I'm curious to know, what do you think musicians can do to actually strengthen the models, strengthen their 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 different offers and services and products? Like in general, like how can musicians strengthen their business models so that they don't just, you know, survive this period but that they actually come out stronger and 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 reinvented uh okay there's two main things that i'm sure you have talked to people about this as well but the two main things that come to mind when you ask that question is that you need to well you need to the the average musician i'll say so with outside in music you know we also do consulting and business development like you do and also doing social media management and like talking to them about how to make a schedule and promote certain posts and all, all different kinds of things in that way. So the number one problem that I see when I look at musician social media is it's always about them. It's always about, here's me, I'm playing a concert, playing a gig, watch my video, watch my CD, blah, 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 watch me, 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 me. And it's always a big problem like that because they're always like, I don't have content to share. I'm not doing any gigs now. It's like, well, uh, you have to kind of flip the model on its head. You got to think about what does the audience, what does my audience want to see? And you can test it very easily by posting different types of content. Uh, maybe, you know, I'll just use a jazz musician as an example because that's, you know, what yeah. I'm familiar with. But, you know, you could video yourself practicing. You could make a live stream of you playing tunes with a pre-recorded tracks. You could um, be talking about practice tips. You could be talking about harmony. You could be talking about your journey of writing music for a project. There's like so many things you can do and you just test those out and see, like you just open up Instagram, you can see how many people watch the videos, you can see how many people save the video to watch it again later. Um, you know, you can get an idea of what they're actually doing and you can just make more of that stuff, you know? So instead of thinking about you first, 
uh, you can switch it around and say, how can I bring value to my audience? How can I bring them something? How can I give them something so that they want to keep coming back to me? Because there's a million jazz pianists that want to post videos of them playing over tunes. But what can you offer that the others aren't going to offer in terms of either it's educational stuff, maybe it's music marketing and business stuff, maybe it's anything. It could just be, uh, we have an alto saxophonist we work with who's an amazing chef and his dad was a chef. And so he makes cooking videos and he talks about Thai cooking and going to Thailand and like learning from, I forget the, which chef he trained with over there, but like what's unique about you? Like we're like embrace that unique thing that's about you if it's if it's fitness or whatever, like it's music and like it's not just like this is my music account. It's like, no, it's you and you are your, the brand. So anyway, thinking about your audience first instead of what you wanna share. So there's a lot of stuff, sometimes my friends are like, why do you post about this or that? I'm like, well, it's because I get questions in my email inbox constantly about that topic. So I'm gonna make a video for those people. And even though you don't care about it, doesn't mean that they don't care about it. So thinking about what does your audience and the people that might actually care about your music or your book or your, show when we have shows again, you know, <laughs> thinking about those people and giving them something that they could actually use. Uh, and then the second thing is figure out how to make a mailing list, an email list. And because uh, you never know what's going to happen uh, with any platform. You could have millions of followers and it almost happened with TikTok and just disappear just like that. And uh, this summer, and then um, so you never know what's going to happen with them. You could have a lot of Instagram pe followers, but doesn't really mean anything if you can't uh, connect with them when you want to connect with them. And so, you know, I pr promote the use of social media ads a lot and I do them for a lot of clients and myself and I think they work really well, but you're still paying to reach people that you've already connected with, you know? So if you can create a strategy for building your email list so you can connect with the people that you want to connect with quickly and consistently, that's good. Uh, that, that would be the second thing I would do. And or you could sub in if you want to uh, like an SMS text messaging service instead of email if you really don't want to do email. But coming up with some kind of way to directly connect with your audience, uh, especially while they're at home, you're at home, you know, figure, figure, figure this stuff out. There's so much information on the, on the internet about this. And um, I guess I'm going to give one more. The third one thing to do is to stop using only musicians as your role models in this space because most of us musicians aren't doing this very well if we look at the, <laughs> the whole but if you look into the marketing space into the business space you look at the brands that you think are doing really well on social media on email all this stuff like look to them look to people that talk about and work in those spaces that can help kind of give you ideas you don't have to do it exactly like them and you know musicians like to talk in a certain kind of way that maybe is different than marketing people might talk in a different way but you you can take inspiration and that's what i like to do is look at other YouTubers, Instagram pe people that are doing certain things. And I know my audience is going to be so much smaller because it's jazz trombone. It's so small, yeah. but I can do it in my own way and use those kind of tactics. So I would hope that anyone watching will be able to, you know, build their own email list, text list, whatever, and kind of take control themselves and not uh, rely on these services that could just change, disappear, charge you so much money to connect with your fans uh, in the future. So. If you don't do anything else, build your audience so that you can sell them something when you have something to sell them. Wow, so powerful, Nick. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is so, like so many great things in what you just shared. I'm just going to take a step back a little bit and just go back to the first part where you shared about kind of building a brand around more than just your side as a musician. I mean, that's such an important part. And it's actually one of the key things that I focus on when I coach musicians, which is like this umbrella branding strategy, right? And kind of not thinking of yourself as like a performer or an educator or a producer, but really like the combination of all these things, including your personal traits, right? Right. Your background, things you grew up with, obstacles you had to overcome and being willing to share that full side of you. I mean, it takes... It takes us an element of vulnerability and i can see why many musicians by default would prefer to not include those things and to just focus on their artistry and like here are my musical chops and like here's how i play right. but right. as you shared today you know in your experience like it's it's the whole person that people really want to get to know and it's really that human side and you know you have a relationship with a chef and you're into cooking and you know all these right. things it's exactly it's so so important that creatives, you know, as musicians, we're willing to kind of, first of all, understand how those impact who we are, 
and then being willing to use that to define like what we want to say and, and our values and our beliefs and the things we stand for and the things we stand against and to build that into the content that we share and the, and the brand and the message. So that's such a powerful, powerful thing that, that you just alluded to. And then when you talked about building your audience, so true that we don't really know what happens with these platforms. Even when you post something on like Facebook or Instagram, you don't know who gets to see those posts. Like, especially if you're using a professional page, which are mainly geared towards ads, right? Like they want you to pay to show those things, right? It's a mm -hmm. pay to play world. You can think that, oh, I've got 20,000 followers and I'm gonna put this post and it's gonna be amazing. The robots ultimately decide what they show and how, who gets to see those posts. Right. So you have absolutely no control, maybe a little more control if you pay for it, but if you're not paying for it, like you really don't know who's gonna even see what you share, right? And then of course it's gonna be buried into the feed of a million other posts. Um, so I could see the advantages of social media platforms and you know they provide a lot of good things. But I, you know, I generally think of it as like you're renting a space if you're posting things and building your audience on social media versus owning your own content and having access to your community through an email list, through you know, kind of compiling your own content as well. Um, and so these are very different ways of, of sharing your content and building your audience. So thank you so much for, for highlighting that. It's, it's so important and we can be sometimes shocked by, oh, so many followers and that doesn't really mean anything these days. So thank you for highlighting those things. Um, sure. that's, that's just been great. So talking about content, right? And things that you share and you contribute to your community. Part of this summit is having our speakers share a free special gift for our audience. And I would love for you to maybe share a little bit about your free gift for our audience. Sure. So uh, speaking of new things in the pandemic, uh, this summer, one of my ideas was to launch a week long uh, music marketing uh, workshop, I guess you would call it, but I ended up calling it the music marketing roadmap, which was a five day uh, lecture every day and Q&A session every day. Uh, and that came and now comes with like a almost a hundred page kind of workbook to kind of work through ideas around content, around branding, around uh, building your audience, around your website, around how to tour, around how to build all the basic things that you would have to figure out, uh, giving you ideas, kind of maybe short shortcuts or workarounds so that you don't have to go through the same pain that I went through uh, and still go through uh, constantly. But uh, so that, for that five day, workshop um, it's it's now an online course as part of the virtual teaching studio that i have uh, and so for the for the audience today what we're going to do is give the first day of that uh, for free so people can kind of check out kind of the overview talking about goal setting talking about all the branding and identity stuff kind of that that first introductory day where we're really we're giving it's not just introduction i know i said introductory day but it's like right. we're talking about branding and marketing uh, for musicians specifically uh not kind of esoteric things but actually like real uh, tactical advice about what to put on your website and what not to put on your website and where to put it and things like that and um yeah and the workbook i think is really helpful i mean it's not a thing where you can just watch if you're a person that just wants to sit back and watch me talk and then you're going to get something out of it, it's not going to be for you. It's got to be for a person that wants to watch and do some work and right. think and brainstorm. And so um, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to uh, set that up so you, you all can check out uh, the first day of that. And then if you want more, you can obviously uh, go ahead and enroll in the course. But I'm happy to share that first day uh, of the course with you. And, um, and I look forward to being able to connect with more of you soon. Thank you, Nick. That is really, really wonderful. What a treat for our audience. And that's just going to be, I'm sure, so useful, especially now. So that's, I'm so glad. And thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. And before we wrap up, I'd love for you to maybe share what's next for you. You know, what are your next plans? What's coming up for you? We're about to start a new year. How, how are things panning out for you? What is coming up? I'm sure you have lots of projects and knowing you, you're not just sitting still. So let us give us a window into Nick's, Nick's plans. Sure. Uh, well, I had a lot of musical plans that I'm not sure of the timeline on now because they were large ensemble projects. And uh, I don't know exactly where those lead to, but writing music and trying to continue to make progress in that way. Um, but I'm also working on a book 
uh, that's called create, connect, repeat. That's kind of the mantra that I use uh, around our business and around uh, some workshops that I give. I've been doing a bunch of speaking at uh, colleges virtually around the country this this last semester, and so I've been I've done it at um, the Jazz Educators Network convention and the NAM show. Uh, the same talk, just called create, connect, repeat, which is kind of similar content to what's in the music marketing roadmap and just what we're talking about today, um, but. I'm turning that into a book, so that'll be, I don't know how long it takes to write a book, but this is my first, <laughs> le I've done a lot of music books, but in terms of a, a book, a book book. Or a, right. um, so I'm working on that. We'll see how much longer it takes. It's taken longer than I thought already, but that's okay. And uh, so I'm working on that and uh, kind of going to relaunch the virtual teaching studio next year. And I have um, two or three educational books ready to go that will come out in next 2021 spring uh kind of you know stretch it out a little bit but like i said i've got all this stuff that i've been working on that now i had time to finish and so i'm just kind of looking to stretch it out and take advantage of uh, the stuff that i've saved up so lo lots of things coming oh wonderful how exciting well we can't wait to see you know how all of these projects turn into life and uh thank you so so much for joining us today this has been wonderful I'm sure our audiences are gonna just get so much value from all your experience and all this amazing nuggets of wisdom that you've shared. And, you know, we can't wait to follow your journey and, uh, you know, connect with all of your amazing content and platforms. So thank you, Nick, for joining us. And to all our viewers, remember that you can join our Facebook group, Musicians Creating Prosperity, where you can connect with me and many more musicians. Nick, I invite you to join my community as well. And we can continue these conversations all around understanding how to not only survive in this moment, but actually come out stronger and develop prosperity, affluence, and artistic fulfillment in the process. So thank you for being a part of this summit, Nick. And it's just been a pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for including me. Thank you.